Guten Tag, good morning, everyone. Follow that. Um, and the nicest thing I've heard so far today is Natasha saying that I am difficult to package. I think Sue is also uh, difficult uh, to package. If I could possibly have the slides up, that would be an immense help. Thank you. Um, because I knew that Sue was going to talk about cows, I thought my starter slide should at least have uh, one uh, cow uh, on it. But let me explain. Um, this is a really important year, and we've heard a number of people uh, reference that. And I just wanted to honor GIZ and the state government of Nordrhein-Westphalia for, for starting this series of conferences. Wonderful um, uh, initiative. But this year is extraordinary because of the events we've, we've heard about already. But I'm just going to make a, a very simple case for raising our horizons. Almost whatever happens in 2015, we've got to think about uh, the next Decay. The reason why the cow is there is not simply wanting to build uh, bridges, but that's part of it. Sue and I hadn't met uh, before uh, today. But it is just to show the habitat in which I operate. So I grew up partly on a farm, uh, but most of the work that I've done in the last 30 years has been in business, in the private sector, and increasingly uh, in boardrooms. And the cow is there because about three years ago, I wrote a book on zero-based uh, carbon, zero-based water, zero-based toxics sort of targets uh, in, in, in um, business. And Nestle, which is a company I've worked with for about five years now, said, interesting, come and talk to some of our people from around the world and, and we'll see what we're doing on zero. And it was a real surprise to them what they then found because they found that they were doing it on safety and health they were doing it on total quality management. They were doing it on lean manufacturing, areas like that. And then a group came in from Mexico. And the, the top team in Nestle didn't even know this initiative was going on. But in Mexico, the biggest milk plant that Nestle operates uh, is in a, a water-stressed area. And the big problem that they face is clearly getting enough uh, water. An engineer there said, why don't we go water neutral? Everyone thought he was clinically crazy. But that plant is now water positive. Why? Because when they thought about it, they started to recognize something quite important. Something over 80% of the milk that comes into the plant is water. What did they traditionally do with that water? They flashed it off to steam. So they're now bringing it back into the process loop. So when we talk about mind shifts, these mind shifts have, have to happen uh, everywhere. I think it's an absolutely fundamental uh, point uh, into today's proceedings. I had the privilege of being seven years on the faculty uh, of the World Economic Forum, and I saw many of the issues that we're discussing today struggling to come up the agenda in Davos and places like that, and quite often the forum trying to manage them uh, back uh, to some degree. But if you'd ask me who, if, you know, the, 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 say from 2002 onwards, if you'd ask me who would have said these words on the screen, I won't re read them out, I would have said Greenpeace, Oxfam, somebody like that. The fact that Peter Backer, who was uh, CFO and then CEO of TNT, now president of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, representing hundreds of major companies around the world, is saying this about the future of capitalism. Wow. Something is beginning to uh, change. And I'm not going to go through this. Some of you will have seen this um, uh, already, but we we've tracked the waves of societal um, change since uh, 1960, series of wave structures, primarily in the OECD world, but you see echo effects uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, and we feel that we're coming off a fourth wave uh, structure. And we've labeled that the sustainability wave, not because sustainability was delivered, but suddenly everyone was talking about it and think, thought that they knew that uh, they understood what it was uh, about. The next decade uh, we do see is the breakthrough decade. The triple bottom line, people, planet, profit, uh, was very kindly uh, referenced. That's 20 years ago. It's amazing how slowly some of these things do change. But at the same time, it's remarkable how when the processes of change start, they go off the scale. And I think we're very close into one of those uh, moments. Now, I think the uh, sustainable development goals that have already been uh, mentioned will be very useful in that process, but I want to sound one note of warning. If you're in business, 17 of anything is a little bit complicated. 
It's, it's a real struggle to get yourself uh, 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 aligned with maybe even three or four uh, strategic objectives. 17 is, is, is a problem. I think we've all got a, a challenge to try and make this more uh, business and, in a way, board uh, friendly. And next week, I'm in Seoul in South Korea with the UN Global Compact, um, uh, looking at the post-2015 uh, agenda. And it'll be really interesting to see how Asian business leaders are, are uh, to some degree, waking up to at least elements uh, of all of this. Now, one of the things I wanted to just touch on briefly is the issue of leadership, uh, particularly in the private sector in business. And, and some of you will be aware of Globescan's work uh, since 1997, just tracking uh, businesses, companies around the world, and how they're perceived in terms of their uh, leadership. It's a remarkable graph. Again, I won't read it out, but you see early on companies like uh, BP and Shell and uh, DuPont, Monsanto, uh, uh, misspelled, um, sort of coming up the curve and, and, and then crashing back for different reasons. More recently, you see companies like Unilever uh, coming up. I, I was exchanging emails last night with their CEO, Extraordinary man, Paul Pullman. I was just congratulating him on his um, uh, leadership. And he was saying what he's trying to do is articulate uh, a set of issues, a set of challenges and opportunities that he sees coming up uh, in different parts of the world. There's only one company on this list that has come right the way through uh, that period since 1997. And that's Interface. And many of you will remember uh, the late uh, Ray Anderson. Uh, one of the extraordinary things about that man was that he came up with the, this extraordinary stretch uh, agenda of Mission uh, Zero. Many of his own colleagues, he told us, thought he was, again, clinically insane. I mean, how could you possibly do this? As some of you again will know, early last year, the European end of Interface announced that they'd hit three zero-based targets. Zero fossil energy, uh, zero waste landfill, and net zero uh, water. Quite remarkable um, uh, achievement. We did a case study on that, but I, the, the point I want to make with this slide is very simple. If we rely on people like Ray Anderson and the rising generation of social entrepreneurs and so on to do all of this for us, we're going to be very disappointed. Because the world of politics, the world of government, the world of policy making is absolutely fundamentally important. And the subtitle of this conference, From Politics to Implement Implementation, absolutely fantastic. But if we think we've done the politics, or even begun to do the necessary politics, they've scarcely uh, yet uh, begun. And I think business, which used to be uh, very badly mistrusted, and for good reason, um, has a very important role to play in all of this. So, uh, a couple of years back, um, uh, Jochen Zeitz, who many of you remember as CEO and chairman of Puma, uh, set up uh, with uh, Richard Branson, uh, the B team. Jochen and I did a book on this, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of the messages that came through from that. And th these are about the role of business in this space. And the first one is really stretching their time horizons, their ambitions, and their goals and targets. And I think the, the Sustainable Development Goals will help with that, uh, but as I say, they need to be better focused. I think new forms of accounting are coming up very, very rapidly, but they're happening in experimental ways. They're not yet uh, going out to scale in the way that they would need to be. I think business has a really important role. When I came in and started to talk to companies 35 years ago, they were all talking about leveling the playing field, but downwards. And now the question is, how do we get business to help us all raise the playing field uh, upwards. And then, again, these uh, emergent concepts of uh, biomimicry, the sharing economy, the circular economy, and so on, uh, immensely exciting. And some of the companies that we work with is, I mean, one of the companies we work with in Germany is biomaterial science. Some of you will know that they're going through an IPO uh, at the moment. And what's interesting is the old order, you wouldn't have talked very much about sustainability as you started to sell a business like that off. What's happening with biomaterial science is sustainability is built into the offering to uh, financial uh, institutions, to investors, and so on. Key part of that is Patrick uh, Thomas, shown with the red tie. 
They're doing some interesting work. Uh, for example, they, they uh, sponsored uh, Bertrand uh, Picard with the Solar Impulse Expedition, but much more interestingly, I think, in terms of today's agenda, uh, Bayer have a, a, an initiative called Project Sunrise, and the aim there is to take technology right the way through to the base of the pyramid. What are they finding? Really, really difficult. What are they doing? Well, they're not giving up. That, 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 that's one thing. But the, the uh, bar there is a solar-dried uh, banana uh, from Thailand, then chocolate-coated. Uh, I think we're starting to see some really, really interesting uh, initiatives and companies uh, like this. Some of you will have seen th this sort of image. This comes from World Mapper. It shows that what's happening in this world of ours, uh, various speakers have already uh, referenced that this morning, demographic shifts, economic shifts, political shifts. The center of gravity of our planet is shifting quite uh, profoundly. And um, we started, and this was funded by Al Gore and David Blood's firm, Generation Investment Management, a project about 10 months ago. And it was designed to be a short report. And then it became a white paper. And then five weeks ago, we were sitting on the sofas in our London office thinking, this isn't going anywhere uh, effective at the moment because there are so many reports out there now. There are so many white papers. What are we going to do? Simple answer, we turned it into a play. So it's a dramatization of a boardroom uh, discussion around the sorts of issues that we're uh, talking about today. Now, that, that, that play is launched today. There are copies outside. I encourage you to take some. And in the play, so these, uh, Sue showed some real farmers and their children and so on. These are imaginary people. They're, they're people based on our experience in working in boardrooms and C-suites around the world. One of them, a very powerful woman, uh, the, 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 she calls herself the chairman, um, is trying to bring into uh, the boardroom of this company the sort of agenda that you increasingly see uh, coming up within um, Harvard Business Review, for example. But I heard just the other day that this cover, the, Har the Harvard Business Review cover, uh, was the worst-selling uh, issue of <laughs> the HBR uh, last year. So, it, you know, even if they're covering these sorts of stories, they're not yes, ne necessarily taking off in the way that they need to. Now, we heard earlier on that this wonderful uh, space hosted the Nexus uh, conference a, a little while back. World Economic Forum has done a lot of work on those sort of global risks. And what we have just done is to try and translate that into a, a business image of what this agenda feels like. It feels like a pressure cooker for, what, uh, for those of you who can remember. The heat is being turned up by demographic pressures, by things like globalization, uh, by global warming. In the middle, you have a series of issues that are increasingly interrelated in ways that they didn't used to be. And increasingly, they're called security issues, not an accident. On the top, you have a lid trying to hold all of this in. So we are far better off with the United Nations than we would be without it. But is it truly functional for the 21st century? I really don't think so. So we have a major collective uh, challenge. And out of that come a bunch of things. You know, geopolitical unrest, stranded assets if you're an investor, uh, intergenerational tensions. And you just look around the world and you can see this happening. This is the, the latest uh, cover of Newsweek, for example. California really is an indicator of where we may be uh, headed in all of this. A second role, the CEO. Often CEOs actually get this agenda because they, you know, they're exposed to the outside world in the way that chief financial officers and so on uh, aren't. Um, and in, in this particular case, we've got a South African uh, in that role. Uh, and one of the things that he's very acutely aware of is that adoption curves for new technologies and new business models are changing profoundly. Many of you will remember the gray curve if you went to business school or whatever, which you know, fairly, fairly... Um, rapid rise, a, a, a plateauing, and then it falling away. What people in places like Silicon Valley now talk about is the Big Bang, or perhaps, uh, for obvious reasons, the shark's fin adoption curve, where things come through very, very fast indeed. Now, that's fine if you're doing software, but not necessarily if you're doing infrastructure. But increasingly, uh, this CEO in particular uh, feels that that's a pattern of, uh, uh, of development that they will have to wrestle with. But there are enormous opportunities uh, out there. And uh, he starts to talk about some of the, we used to think a million was a big number. And then we thought a billion was a big number. 
And now we're sort of fairly comfortably talking about trillions, and many of the, the, the market opportunities in this space are increasingly uh, measured uh, in the trillions. And then we bring the CFO in, because the CFO traditionally has been one of the roles that has resisted uh, change. And this particular CFO struggles throughout the dramatization, but in the end understands that this is no longer simply about integrating multiple forms of capital, social, uh, natural, human, intellectual, and so on. Not simply about integrated reporting, and that's something more and more CFOs are doing, but it's about how you link all of this, how you go down to the chicken farm in uh, uh, Kenya, for example, right out, if you're KFC or similar, right out to the level of, of, of the biosphere and atmosphere, and how you do that over the long term. CFOs are really going to struggle with this, but it's part of their uh, forward uh, challenge. This is my last slide, um, and, and, and I don't use this lightly. When I was born uh, in the late 1940s, people were struggling to break through the sound barrier. And there were physicists and aeronautical designers who would say it's impossible. Chuck Yeager uh, broke through, showed that it was possible. In a very short order, a lot of people went through. And I think we're somewhere similar with the sustainability barrier. People are beginning to break through in some really interesting ways. They're not yet doing it at the scale or at the speed, as Sue said, uh, that we need. But it's happening. And I think the breakthrough component of it is, is really important. Some of the things that will happen in the next decade are virtually unimaginable uh, today. And um, I just put up Peter Diamandis and the XPRIZE Foundation quotation because I think it's a nice summary of where we are in all of this. So the last 10 years, we've seen people like Muhammad Yunus and Bunker Roy, great friend and colleague uh, in the audience uh, today, uh, being symbolic of this emergent uh, movement of social innovation, social entrepreneurship, impact investment, and so on around the world. Immensely uh, exciting. At the same time, we've seen people like Elon Musk. Well, I say people like Elon Musk. There aren't many people like uh, Elon Musk. But it, at least here's somebody almost like Henry Ford, three companies. Tesla alone, now as some of you will know, uh, is worth almost half what General Motors is worth. And this is a company that is currently producing about 30,000 40,000 cars against millions uh, for GM. Something is happening out there that is immensely uh, uh, important and I think immensely uh, exciting. And here's the final point. Two weeks ago, I was in Dubai. Many of you will know that the uh, United Arab Emirates are enormously interested in clean technology. Dubai is positioning itself, or trying to, as the capital, the, the capital of the world green economy. Now, I don't think there'll be one capital of this economy that is building. I think there will be multiple uh, capitals. I think Bonn is already immensely well uh, placed for that. And one of the things I look forward to today is some of the, meeting some of the people who've made that happen uh, to date and who have plans uh, for doing more of that uh, in the future. That's the end of my story, Natasha, uh, and all of you. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.